Research Center tweeted, racism and discrimination are critical public health issues that demand an urgent response along with the hashtag Black Lives Matter. CEO Greg Glassman posted several controversial tweets referencing George Floyd's death in the coronavirus pandemic. We're not mourning for George Floyd. I don't think any, I don't think me or any of my staff can you tell me why I should mourn for him. But now I gotta say something special. I'm and racist. Now the gym is going to look like, a, like, a, like it's reparations or something. It, it bothers me a lot. A national backlash after comments from a CEO and Derby fit, City CrossFit, fit, Blue fit, House, and, and Magnus athletic. dropping their affiliations with CrossFit. CrossFit affiliates all over the country are looking for ways to distance, even sever ties with the popular brand. Hundreds of gyms. That's in one day. Across the world, more than a thousand gym owners have joined them. Reebok and fitness equipment maker Rogue Fitness have also cut ties with the brand. The founder and CEO of CrossFit is out. He stepped down after his tweet about George Floyd's part of some social media backlash. And that fallout continues as a wave of affiliated gyms cut ties with the company. I cannot count the number of times that derogatory and specifically sexual comments were made about female staff members. It was an open secret as to who was potentially in the sexual crosshairs for group. Uncomfortable travel arrangements, a trip is coming up but only one hotel room is booked, or female employees sitting alone in a vehicle with the CEO being told what Greg prefers from his women. Out this New York Times article about Greg Glassman's behavior creating a sexist environment at CrossFit. CrossFit founder Greg Glassman selling his gym business. The privately held company is now going to be sold to Eric Rosa the owner of a CrossFit gym in Colorado. If CrossFit stands for something, and we know it does, it stands for that as well. It stands for we see people's common humanity, and we are not going to discriminate against people, and we're going to affirmatively reach out and make sure people feel welcome. It was actually during the Open of 2018 that I got diagnosed. I was a trainer. I did my workouts, took good care of my body and everything as much as possible. And then what happened was, out of nowhere one day at work, my one leg started having some weird feelings. Almost like I had to start thinking physically how to pick up my leg, move it forward, step, and pull. Uh, I was on my right side and, you know, went through a whole day of work as a trainer and people thought that there was something wrong with me and I'm like, there probably is, but that's fine, I still have to work. <laughs> Next day was Saturday, March 17th, St. Patrick's Day. The first year that I was 21 on a St. Patrick's Day. So it was kind of funny because everyone's like, yeah, you can't go out because you already look like a drunk man walking around. <laughs> so I was like, yeah, fair enough, I'll stay home. The symptoms were getting worse. I was having to think more and more about how to walk. It was almost like my leg was just dragging with me. I fell over. I was on the floor and I didn't really know what happened. I kind of had to crawl across the floor, like just drag myself because I couldn't use my legs. My right hand just wasn't working. And I had to get to my phone because that was the next thing that I knew I had to do. So I got to my phone, called my parents, and I just said, I don't know what's going on. Like I. I need help, I need to go to the hospital. Luckily, we had a family friend who was able to pick me up and take me to the hospital. I wanna say it was three CAT scans, two MRIs, and a spinal tap. Later, they found out that I had holes in my brain or lesions in my brain and that I had multiple sclerosis. At that point, I couldn't walk. Uh, it was very frustrating. I almost looked like Forrest Gump when I first tried to run. 
I was very determined to push every limit I could whenever I could, essentially. I was in the hospital. The first things that I did was get on my walker. Every day at 5 a.m., I didn't care. It was funny. The nurses were like, good morning, Brett. And I was like, Judy, it's nice to see you. I'm, I'm in the middle of a workout here. And they're like, you keep going. Then I'd go by and talk to them. And they were great, great staff there at the hospital that took care of me. I would hang on to walls and like, there was like an air conditioner and a chair that I had my hands on to try to do a squat of any sort. I did like some stationary lunges. It was very slow, very controlled. And that was kind of where I started at after my diagnosis. When I got out of the hospital, I was able to walk. So that was a plus. Heading to the gym, I had no idea what was gonna happen. I had my best friend with me, which made my mom more <laughs> comfortable that I had my best friend with me to help train and get me started. And it was funny, I would run and it was my sprint. And my sprint was like this floppy dude just trying to figure out how to move again. And every time I would come back the opposite direction, I would see if I could go just a little bit faster and a little bit faster, and then out of nowhere, boom, it hits you and your whole body drains like a battery and you know that you hit that max. And it wasn't fast. <laughs> it was just out of nowhere, your legs decided they wanted to shut down and you should stop before you hurt yourself. Squatting, went back to the bar. And cleans, went back to the bar. Like, I did not do a Metcon for probably a month before I decided to see what I could do because they said, your body is essentially now like a battery. If it overheats, you're kind of screwed. So heat is a huge battle with MS, um, especially in the designs of Metcons and how those work. Your body is meant to heat up during a Metcon and to find like a 75 to 85% aerobic capacity to hang on to. Obviously you have your better days where you can go 90, 100%, but you know, it's a risk every time I step on that floor to make sure that my body doesn't shut down on me. Because if my muscles give out, they, it's not like normal people's muscles giving out. It's like, you're done. You, you can't do this. So I did everything I could in my ability training wise to make sure that I was going to have my assets in line on my capabilities there. With our adaptation in neurological disorders, it's very hard to see through the visible eye. Uh, we have our good days, we have our bad days. It's an autoimmune disorder where you could just wake up one day feeling like the worst version of yourself. I always knew that I lacked strength in my legs um, overall, and I tried to just do everything as regular CrossFit as possible. Um, I never wanted to think of myself as different. And then I found, well, I was different. You know, like I, it's always funny, everyone's always like, ah. Oh. Like, that's awesome that you can do that. And I'm like, I'm just like you. I just have holes in my brain. That's the only difference. <laughs> you know, I, I love watching the games. So I've seen them YouTube live and watching like the behind the shoulder of seeing the athletes corralled up and then jogging out onto the Coliseum and thinking that's where I'm going to be. That's unbelievable. Like to think that me, somebody who never ever could keep up with those guys in that kind of effort is getting this opportunity to be out on there. It's, it's going to feel unreal in all honesty. It still has maybe only settled in 50% that I am here competing in the CrossFit Games. For someone like myself who has been doing adaptive competition for several years now at essentially the highest level that we've we've had the opportunity to do it's something that we've all talked about and, and everyone asks me about people who are outside of the adaptive world um, but maybe kind of know about the crossfit games that's always kind of like things that they want to know about like why why are you guys not there yet when is it going to happen with how long it, it almost feels like it's been a process of staying involved to event, you know, eventually get, get the adaptive divisions here to the games. I always had this dream, because as soon as I got involved into sports, I loved it, and I submerged completely on it. With the Open there, when they announced they were having these divisions, I was like, wait a second, 
I see these like qualifications and everything, and I'm like, that's me. Like, I, I'm an adaptive athlete. And then that kind of came to me, I'm like, I'm in this division, so I signed up for it. It was the first time that I felt I was fully included with my capabilities. I wasn't like totally destroyed by a workout and just felt like defeated. Like I wasn't able to do something just because of my abilities here. I always wanted to come and see the games, but also I knew that I am a very, very competitive person. I'm a very, very aggressive competitive person. I had this idea in my head that if I'm not going as a spectator, I will be there as a competitor. I don't know when, I don't know how, but I'm gonna be able to do that. It's been years and years of sacrificing. We had the Open, and we were getting in touch during the Open, and we all were emailing CrossFit like, oh, is there gonna be another stage? Like, what's next? After they announced quarterfinals for individuals, and we got responses like, unfortunately at this time, you know, this is the first year we're doing this, that's gonna be the end of it. Uh, we hope to see more growth in the adaptive divisions as time goes along. And then you get that email, or you see the Instagram post that says, CrossFit announced that there's going to be three divisions in the Adaptive League based on the top five finishers. Once we got the news that CrossFit Games was going to accept our division, uh, you know, here this year in Madison. And we were all like texting each other like, did you get an email? Did you get something? And we're all like, no, we didn't get anything. What's going to happen? You got five people. We were in the top five. This is awesome. So we're waiting anxiously. By mid-June, we finally got our official invite and we were like, Oh, thank God. <laughs> we kept thinking, like, are we going to get it? When's it going to happen? So mid-June, when we finally did get those invites, it was, it was nuts. It's first experience. It's first years. It's CrossFit is a, it's a young sport. Flagship year for the adaptive athletes. So it's incredible to be part of, like, the pioneering group. And I'm, I'm just so grateful for the experience. We're all just happy that this opportunity that none of us thought would even be possible was given to us. It's gonna be a, a testament to all the work we've put to me, believing that I was not gonna be good at anything, right? As, as a kid, to walk on the biggest venue of the sport, it's like, man, you are wrong. You are wrong and I, I'm glad that we proved us right, that we, we could be good at something. And it's not just we, we could be good at something, it's just that we got to the biggest competition in this sport. It's just a testament to all the, all the work we put in, all the, all the fights. Enjoy the moment. I know we're gonna get a hard, a hard, hard, hard workout. So I know we're starting tomorrow. I know there's something about a long run, something about deadlifts and rope plants, and something about heavy snatches. Let's see what happens. I'm pretty excited about it. We gathered up in North Park Stadium with no idea what the path was gonna be. Like, hey, uh, what's, what, what's the path? Like, how, how do we run through this? And he was just like, it's marked. <laughs> like, okay, I mean, that's fair enough. Like, how are you gonna describe it at that point? Hey, three mile run. Let's see what the zombie leg can do. That was a really long, long event. And I just had to remind myself, like, run your own race because it's a long duration event. And a lot of times people go out hot and you have people on either side of you and you're just seeing how hard they're going and you want to try to keep up. But, you know, you go out hot in the first five minutes and then you tank through the rest. I just tried to keep as even pace as possible. Every lap I knew no matter how tired I was, I had to make sure I smiled once I got around that corner because my kids are gonna see me on camera. My wife, she was in there, had the phone, and when I came, was coming around on the lap, she just had them there say hi to daddy. I've never done that long on a ski erg before. We did a lot of skiing, a lot of skiing. Running, I'm all for it. I started very fast, very fast. I had a number in my, my mind, a pace that I usually try to keep when I train. My coach, Casey Cree, 
is my coach, and uh, we've done a lot of cardio stuff. I had kind of an idea of what I needed to do in order to be able to withstand that 6,000 and then be able to kind of kick it in a little bit at the end. Casey's programming, I get two days of pretty much just monostructural conditioning and I affectionately call it Casey's cardio crap, triple C, and uh, worked out to my benefit on that workout. I really love to run, so that was a really good start for me. That was the fastest 5K I ever ran, so um, I placed top five in the world in that event. That's how I feel. As the adaptive athletes leave their first ever CrossFit Games event, a wrench is thrown in the gears of a carefully orchestrated day one itinerary. Inclement weather overtakes the Alliant Energy Center and fans and athletes alike are sent running for shelter as events are postponed until further notice. We've spoke past few days uh, a lot, like say even in the open, the the first two workouts they weren't they weren't scaled the first they were the same as everyone else, but then the third one, it just seemed like they'd gone from one extreme to the other. They over scaled it. So they kind of was doing like jumping pull ups, like V sits, and like jumping chest to bar, whereas the open category were doing like toes to bar. Um, pull ups, the chest bar, and then muscle ups. That's the hard part, right? You have athletes here who are starting. For me, for example, it was jumping pull ups, right? You have them do jumping pull ups, then they get here. How are you going to ask them to do pull ups? It's completely different, but we've trained for it. And the third workout was, it, it was a workout, of course, but it, it just felt that they overscaled it. I think. People assume that we can't do that. I'm, I'm quite grateful in the sense that I'm glad that they were jumping ones because I don't think I'd be able to do the full ones. So that's probably the reason that I've made it here. But I also feel really bad for the people that do have them and like they can't show them off. They can't be like, right, well, I've done, I've done it exactly the same as you have. People are kind of assuming that like, because we are adaptive, we're just automatically scaled people, and we're not. One big thing that we've always strived to do is to not just find the least disabled people, but to also find the, just the fittest adaptive people. Um, and I think that those are two kind of mutually exclusive things. If we say that adapting is not scaling, then we didn't live up to that on the third. Uh, workout of the Open. When I went to the Strongman gym the first time, the owner was like on his head, like, Oof, how can I do things for this guy? He didn't say anything, but then when he turned around, I was doing pull ups. He was like, there you go. I, I know, I know this guy will be able to do anything because he is. So it's the same. Before you let people judge you or talk, just show them that, show, show them what you can do. It's exciting for me because there's so many things that I need to master. And it's not a case of, I can't do it because of my hand. It's a case of, I've not tried it. Every VA doctor I go to, every regular doctor I go to, they're amazed that I can even run or hold a pull-up bar, let alone pull the weights that I can off the floor or be able to move um, because I have a grip in this hand. They're like, how do you even do these things? It's like, because CrossFit teaches you how to embrace discomfort. When there's pressure on my hand, it doesn't work. So I have always here my splint for workouts. Usually I do not wear it in free time. I had people, they told, yeah, you just ha have an injury and you're not fully adapted. What's fully adapted? You can 
have everything, but if the function is not right or doesn't work for, for your lifetime. So I think that's the most misunderstanding what I get, and that was hard. Most don't understand what neuromuscular means, and as I began to educate them, they're like, I had no idea that existed. So educating people on, uh, even my own friends didn't know what that division meant. And when I explained that to them, they go, oh my God, that's, I had no idea. Um, or even how it could even impact you in the middle of a workout and how you're consistently overcoming challenges throughout those moments. I've never done rope climbs. Like, I don't think it's the sense that I've got no hands, that I can't do rope climbs. I genuinely think it's just because I've never done a rope climb. But it's not because, like, I'm missing a hand. It's just I've not tried it. And I just think, like I said before, it just takes me a little bit longer than your everyday person. Um, but, like, any workout that we do in our box at the gym, I'll do it the same as everyone else. Yeah, I might not be able to do, what, um, two dumbbell cleans or something like that, or two dumbbell snatches, um, but I'll find a way to do it, like, on one side. Like, I might just do a heavier dumbbell on one side, or um, we'll always find a way like that, rather than it being like a, right, you're adaptive, you can only ever do one arm. I want to have a good test. I want to show the world what adaptive athletes can actually do. I don't want to settle. I don't want to scale. I want, instead of them adapting the workouts, us adapting to the workouts. Fortunately for the athletes, the weather clears just as quickly as it arrived. The North Park field is reopened to fans and promptly returns to an energetic buzz. An army of volunteers descend upon the field with dire energy and purpose. Their goal is to quickly get equipment out and prepped for event two, doing anything they can to recapture some semblance of what was supposed to be the day's competition schedule. Athletes corralled in the entry tunnel watch anxiously as heavy weights are rolled onto the field and climbing ropes are released from the massive Rogue Zeus rig. This test of fitness has something for everyone. Athletes will fight through five rounds of rope climbs and heavy dumbbell power snatches or heavy deadlifts, depending on their adaptation. Rope climbs are kind of my jam. I love rope climbs. It's the first time I do a rope climb. Well, maybe I can make up enough time on the rope that the deadlifts I can take a little bit more time with. I learned it one day before the competition. Snatches are one of my favorite exercises. Dumbbell power snatches, which I was hoping for, you know, some heavy single arm dumbbell movements. I love deadlifts. I really like heavy barbell stuff. It's the most functional movement to me. <laughs> That's a heavy way to be doing for 25 reps. Brett finds himself on the side worried about the heavy barbells and how his multiple sclerosis could impact his ability to churn out reps. Whenever you fill out your form, they say what's your favorite movement and what's your least favorite. And I put that my least favorite was heavy deadlift. I don't do heavy deadlifts just because of how it lights up my central nervous system. I don't have a solid connection through my lumbo-pelvic region to go ahead and make that connection to my hamstrings. So sometimes I'm pulling heavy deadlifts with my lower back, which is what you don't want to do. And it's not by my positioning or by anything of the sort. It's just purely my lower back will just pop out. When I saw that weight, I was like, oh, that's going to be rough. This is the exact kind of classic CrossFit style workout these athletes train for daily in the gym. They take the field and get set for the starting buzzer.
I got the first three rope climbs good. Went to the fourth one, was almost there. Left hand and left leg just said, I'm done. <laughs> Burned the crap out of my hand. We could use our legs. I don't know what happened during it, but my legs, I don't know if it was adrenaline going through me, but I couldn't get my legs to figure out how to do a rope climb. And I've done a million of them with my legs. So I did the first one legless. Every time I went back to the rope, I tried to use my legs once or twice, but if it wasn't quick enough, I just started using my arms to go through there. They were very heavy. And then since I got here, I'm pretty sure I lost another like five pounds. So at this point, I think it was about twice my body weight. It is cool to run over the field to the finishing line. So the Fran cough, when your lungs are on fire and you're just coughing for the rest of the day, even possibly into the next morning, I had that. After that event, I was just like, I could not breathe for the life of me. My lungs were on fire. You know, we, we have bodies and we should be doing something with them. CrossFit, it may not be for every person. I mean, you talk to people all the time that they thought CrossFit was was dumb. And I was like, I've heard something about CrossFit and it's like, I don't know, man, it's too intense and and I don't want to be like a T-Rex with my arms and all that. So I don't know, man, maybe, maybe, yeah, I don't know. I don't know that I can do CrossFit because like I'm airman and I don't know that I can do movements and I don't know that it's really for me. My brace gets in the way and stuff. I've seen it for a while, but I was always really scared to try it. I didn't uh, have any good feelings towards CrossFit. I was like, oh, you know, that's whenever you see all the bad videos and you're like, people getting hurt, I don't want to do that. I also am a physical therapist, so CrossFit has kind of a bad rap in the physical therapy world. Uh, lots of injuries and stuff with bad coaching and bad programming, but um, I didn't really know that as a physical therapist, like from the outside. I do know places that people go in and they are producing a lot of business for me. Um, other places I don't see very many people because they're they have the good coaching, they have thoughtful programming, and it you can't just look at CrossFit as a whole and be like that's not good. People are going to get injured. If you look at the research, CrossFit doesn't produce any more injuries than say Olympic lifting or and you know some other um, sports that are out there. It's it's pretty even whereas you know people think crossfit produces so many injuries if you look at the, the research that's out there it's not it's very comparable to other sports um, that have that kind of intensity we have a crossfit gym on our school grounds so they're like okay so if you want to play sport for the school then you need to do crossfit just to make sure you don't get injured i did bodybuilding for three years and um, decided that it was time for me to break. My body was giving me some very strong signals that I couldn't do that anymore. I was going to take a season off. They give you critiques, of course, and they're like, glutes and hamstrings, you gotta work on glutes and hamstrings. And my friend was like, you should come to my CrossFit gym. You know, we do lots of glutes and hamstrings. It's the summer of like the butt or something ridiculous like that. I was a bikini cat competitive for two years. And then obviously I think when you're in bodybuilding community, looking at CrossFit is just like, oh, it's crazy people running about and jumping about. Like, what is that? So I like kind of prejudged it before I was trying it. What you see on TV is not CrossFit. That's the number one thing I would say, is that we have this allure of the games and what we see there. But when you go into CrossFit, 
you would never know people that actually do CrossFit. They're your local mom, your dad, grandpa, grandmas. I always say the average demographic of CrossFit is a 42 to 45 year old mom and dad. They're everyday people who go about life who are just looking at the constant pursuit of a better version of themselves. It's a mentality thing, it's just that if you try hard enough, there's nothing you cannot do. And that's addictive, right? You think, well, you go to a CrossFit bar, you're like, these guys are crazy. This, they're right, climbing a rope, they're uh, doing muscle ups, like they are walking on their hands. Well, I, well, I can't do that, right? But the beautiful thing is that when you look around, it's just your everyday people doing amazing things. If you find the right gym, people in the gym, whether they're coaches or they're other people working out, are you know the most helpful and encouraging um, people because they were all there in that at, at one point as well. They everyone was a beginner at some point. There's very few people who have just always been involved in the gym. They everyone had to make that first step to walk through the doors, and you're gonna find people everywhere that you go that are going to want to help you, they're gonna to wanna to encourage you. And so maybe for some people it's finding that, that small community or a big community like a, a big CrossFit gym or something like that. I think the coolest thing about CrossFit that I appreciate now is the community, is the camaraderie you bring. And that's the thing I miss most about team sports and being in the military is we had a term called ETS or embrace the suck and everybody is embracing it together. I literally fell out of love with the, doing the bodybuilding stuff and I was like, you know what? I'm enjoying this CrossFit stuff. I'm enjoying all like the company from everyone else. Like that's one of the massive things with it, I think. Coming from bodybuilding, it's quite a lonely sport. You're the one that's going that way. Whereas now it's like I've got the full community of everyone with me. Even my coach then like he's absolutely buzzing from it. And it's just nice that you're not by yourself. I had this inner athlete that was like, I want to get after it. Like, I want to make sure that my workouts are tough. I don't want to do sets and reps. I want to like go from one to the next and keep my heart rate up. So I called it interval training. So I was just like, no, you need to come to my CrossFit gym. It's different. Everybody's different. Hey man, you should come with me. You should come with me. Like, I mean, you're going to love this. I mean, you should come with me and you should train with me and I know you're going to like this. And she's like, no, 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 I, I mean it. It's like, mine's different. I was like, I'm gonna have to try this. I'm gonna have to stop bad mouthing it and actually see if it's any good. And then I was hooked then. It didn't take me long to get hooked. So I, I bought like a punch pass and I was like, no, I'll do it and supplement to what I was doing before. And um, I went in for one workout and it was a deadlifting workout. And that's something that I have a really hard time with is pulling from the floor because of the limitations in my, my leg and it felt amazing. She was right, like the gym was just different. And then I was like, I drank Kool-Aid and I've been doing it ever since. I finally looked at myself in the mirror and was like, you do CrossFit, <laughs> like that's what you do. A guy like came to our gym and he, all these workouts, that he, he did like a class and all these workouts that he did were all very much CrossFit style workouts. And I just like, I really enjoyed them. And then I was like, I need to find myself a box. So I did and I'm still there now. You don't know what to expect because you can't do everything that everybody else in the gym does. Like you can't, you, it looks different. So you obviously scared people's gonna watch, people's gonna say, oh, what is she doing? Why is she doing it like that? So at the first time I literally went into my own corner, nobody should listen to me, nobody should watch me. I like, literally just want my own corner to do anything. And then you realize, no, that community aspect is actually what makes it so much better. Not you at your own in the gym doing stuff that you want people to see. It was because you were walking into the unknown like I'd done it in this class, so I knew a little bit of like what it was, but I think when you're on the outside looking in, you've literally got no idea really. Finally around 2017, I decided I want to attempt to go do CrossFit. I dropped into Shenandoah CrossFit and mistakenly decided to take pre-workout before going ahead and doing this thing called Karen. I went in there, I puked horribly. And what color was the pre-workout? Red. Oh. Fruit punch. Oh. I can still taste it. <laughs> For me, it was very scary. Like, I, I sent emails and make sure, like, I literally I walked into the gym and walked back out to my car, walked in and walked back. And I was sitting and I was like, oh, this is so scary. I don't want to do this. And it's the best decision in my life was to walk through those doors. Obviously, I was so nervous. Even for the first three weeks, I was there a few times a week. I was so, so, so nervous. Um, but it was the the best decision I've ever made. So my advice for anyone is literally just to go do it. I lived in the States for about 
five years and uh, I used to do strongman in here. Towards the last year I started strongman and I loved it. I loved it, I did my, a meet, a, an open meet, and I just loved that. And I, ha I went back to Spain, I went back home, and I wanted to keep training strongman, but I didn't really have a, a gym where I could train that. Uh, my coach would send me the, the, my, my planning, but I just, I just couldn't do it in a commercial gym. So a friend of mine recommended this CrossFit gym. I messaged them and it's like, hey, can I do, can I train there? Like, can I do my trainings there? And they're like, yeah, for sure. Come do up in box. And month after month, I was just seeing people do double unders, do climbing ropes and, and doing snatches. And I was like, I really want to try that. Uh, did my first class, loved it. Uh, I started doing classes and I just like, I, I love this. I just wanna, I just wanna get better at this. So they had an adaptive competition. I was like, let's go. The first day that I made my first pull up, that got me there. At first, it was the allure. Like when you watch things like the CrossFit Games, you look at it and you say, those guys are pretty, pretty badass. Try it for a month, and they'll just, they just love the experience of. I set so many limits to myself and I've been coming for weeks and I couldn't do a double under, now I do double unders. You'll see that you have no limits if you try hard enough. Event three brings a moment many of these athletes have dreamed of for years. For the first time in their competitive careers, they'll be taking the floor of the Coliseum, widely considered hallowed ground of the CrossFit Games since their move from California in 2017. It's a venue whose raucous energy and ambiance has bared witness to the crowning of legends in the sport like Tia Claire Toomey and Matt Fraser as the fittest on earth in their divisions. Titles our athletes are fighting to earn, many of whom were inspired to compete by the competitors they've watched battle it out under these very spotlights on this same competition floor. <laughs> Literally, I, like... Oh, no, no. It's insane, isn't it? Don't know how it's gonna feel at all. It's 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 a lot. It's a lot. I mean, just as a CrossFit athlete, you, we look at the Coliseum right now the same way that basketball players think of Madison Square Garden or football players think of you know Lambeau Field or, or Cowboy Stadium. I've seen all the videos of like you see Tia and Matt behind the curtain, and you see the lights and you hear the music. And just walking around there, I was getting a little bit like. Oh my God, like, I'm going to be here and all these people are going to be watching, like, not just me, like everyone there, but it just seems like... It is, it is the place that our sport, the pinnacle of, of who we look up to and, and, you know, who in our sport is kind of the gold standard, it, it's where they... It's where they do their work. For the little mental, mental game, you actually need to picture yourself so it's not that scary if you go in. But I tried to picture it and I can't. Like I can't, I don't think I ever, like obviously we, I played netball at a national level. So you, you, part of, you kind of know what to expect, but you don't know what to expect. Hopefully I can, um, you know, be aware enough to kind of take in how I'm feeling. I'm obviously going to be focused on the workouts and, and what I need to do and, and the job that I want to get done. It looks a lot different than it does on TV. I'm telling you, just by being here, you, you can feel the energy already. I mean, it's a little bit overwhelming, but well, you gotta come out with your thing. You gotta, you gotta know how, you, how you're gonna go, but it's, it's I, I still can't believe it. I still can't believe it. Like, like I'm in the moon. Like I'm in a place like, mm, it's amazing the atmosphere. It's a place big, uh, Corre aire, it's air like that, but it's pressure, good pressure. It's like you have all the people seeing you. You, you feel like that. It's something extra special for Mihail Padrini, who's traveled almost 10,000 kilometers, 5,700 miles from his home in Montevideo, Uruguay. This season for him included an extra challenge of trying to find equipment, any equipment, to train with. Lo hacemos con lo que con lo que había, y así empezamos. Y después más adelante, un tiempo más adelante, se pudo acceder a un gimnasio que es el gimnasio que estoy hoy, que es Instinto CrossFit. 
y ahí tenemos materiales. O sea, es más, o sea, más como un gimnasio de CrossFit. Pero cuando empezó, se empezó era sticks, palos y... palos, cables y muchas ganas. We, we jump rope with the cable. With the cable, like this, cut it. Because it's different than the, maybe the start right here. We don't have bars. We don't have a bar, but not a proper bar for weightlifting. Weight well, I train myself without, <laughs> without materials. I, I recover myself without materials. Uh, why you uh, don't have to, you have to use materials for, for training? No. And the, the way of training is like different because uh, the, the people who train here, when they're child, they are competing in gymnastics, wrestling, uh, so many sports, they have a, a conditioning to their sports that, that in Uruguay, in Argentina, is rarely to see that if you go to play soccer, you go to play soccer. You don't go to run and do weights and do plyometry. Some, some uh, teams in my country, professional teams in soccer, in the younger ages, they prepare, but there are few. And it's a specific sport. We don't have gymnastics, we don't have... Oh, you can uh, make your child go to gymnastics, but you have to make it. As the stadium lights power up for the first time this week, athletes are shuffled almost immediately from event two to the Coliseum. With very little rest time due to the weather delays, they're effectively taking on two heavy events back to back. In the Coliseum, they'll be finding the maximum weight they can lift for a deadlift, snatch, or clean. With the weather conditions, that event got pushed back an hour. Since we were the first series of athletes to go into the Coliseum for event three, we had maybe a 20 minute turnover before we had to go and max out our clean after we just did 25 deadlifts at 275 pounds. Low back, your glutes, your hamstrings are on fire and now you're told you have to go for a max lift event. It was nuts. Everything's warm, but it's also tight. I was secretly hoping that a deadlift one rep max didn't show up and sure enough, I could feel my hamstrings like losing their tightness as soon as I would go through the ground, which is not good because then my whole back is carrying the load, which is also not good after doing all those deadlifts. So I went into it just like, let's just start at 225, hit that, and then we'll go from there and see what happens. All right, we just have to go. I had my, my coach sitting there yelling things out. He was like, are you gonna power clean them? I was like, yeah, because it looks much cooler. Game on, let's go, this is fine. That was amazing. 
I don't think I've experienced anything like that ever in my life. I didn't know which plates I have because it was in pounds. So I told to my judge, yeah, take the blue, take the green. So then it was 295, so oh shit. So yeah, I will try. Good, it is good. And so yeah, then we have to try 300. Come on, good. So we put two and a half each and yeah, it worked. So he was very happy. Once you get on the floor, everything just goes quiet. All I'm focused on is like the task at hand. I can't hear music, I can't hear people. It was just, you go up, grab a barbell, have fun. And with that, athletes close out their first day of competition at the CrossFit Games. As is the nature of the competition, the events of the coming days are kept a close secret, known only to a select few CrossFit Games and staff volunteers. It's nothing these athletes are a stranger to. The concept of embracing the unknown and unknowable is deeply ingrained in the culture of the community and can be found within the walls and workouts of any CrossFit gym around the world. The difference is whether these athletes feel they're rising up to the occasion of representing the adaptive community and advocating through their gritty performance for their continued inclusion in the sport. This is bigger to them than winning. There's still work to be done on, on making it perfect and competitive for each person. You know, when it comes to the adaptive divisions, there's so much variance in what a person's adaptation might look like. So for my division, in the upper limb division, we have some people who have a full arm that have neurological dysfunction in it. We have some people like myself who have some of their forearm, so they're, we're, we're known as below elbow amputees. We have some people that are above elbow amputees, so they don't have an elbow. And so what our movements look like can vary pretty greatly, so we get classified into the same division like the five of us in the lower category are all so very different. Natalie and Sarah are very similar, but then there's Amy and she has an above knee amputation, which is so different than a below knee amputation. Even residual limb length makes a difference. And then Mallory, who has you know her, her ankle injury, and then myself, like I have a knee, but we joke that like my leg doesn't really function like an actual leg. Um, so like we're all so different. But there's still you know, some individual differences of what our workouts may look like or what type of weight we're able to do for certain movements. You're gonna see, you're gonna see when we're competing that there's some differences that should be taken care of really, really, really carefully, really carefully. On the eyes of the world that's gonna see us compete, everybody's gonna be like, what's going on here? It's not excuse. It's not a, oh no, what I'm I don't, I don't care about that. Cause I'm ready for what, what's coming. And I've been training and I've been preparing for this literally my whole life. It's just really taken time for enough people to get involved, to start kind of creating good systems of, of what's appropriate for different divisions. All that we've really been waiting for is for more people to get involved and for there to be people who can, a, a group of people who can make the workouts as fair as possible and as competitive as possible. That bike erg is the worst for somebody with one leg because there's no reciprocal movement, there's no arms to assist. So the fact that it was that particular implement, I was like, shoot, I wish it was something else, like a salt bike, I would even take that. Nobody likes the assault bike. Bike, I don't, uh, it's the first time I used the bike. As bike. I love the concept of bike. Uh, I use that almost every day. It's my favorite piece of equipment. It's all about the bike. 
how you start that bike with those 63 calories. 63 calories is a lot of calories to do there in one go. So you really, really want to know your own pace of what to get for every minute there, just so that way you can come off comfortable and make sure you can keep moving through those CrossFit movements. I was the last one off the bike. When I was the last one off the bike, I was like, I know exactly what's going to happen. Everybody's legs are going to be sore, mine are going to be fresh. And that's, uh, that's what I did was I got off, I went right to the toes to the bar, did all 21 unbroken. The toes to the bar were the interesting thing because I didn't know that we could tell them um, because it's the left leg, I can't lift it up. So on the toes to the bar, I kept missing my left foot because <laughs> I was trying to fling it as hard as I possibly could. I'm uh, better than in GHD, so I did it unbroken. So I really love chippers. It can be done at like high volume, kind of grinding. You have to know your pacing type of movement. Locked up to the dumbbell squats, all 21 unbroken. Squats. There, I'm a little bit weaker. I'm not the best squatter. The dumbbell squats, I would have done them unbroken, but I forgot that you had to keep your hands on the dumbbells the entire time. And I like flipped them because it was getting uncomfortable. And then she was like, no, no, no. I was like, there's no way I can get my hands back under there. So I broke it once. I love lunges. And I'm really good at everything you have to do overhead. I cared about. It was like a, it was like a 100 pound sandbag. I like strongman type events. So I was like, I'm just gonna pick this thing up like it's a little kid. Throw it on my back and let's squat. The sandbag squats, that's a different story. That, your lungs are burning now at this point. You're moving a heavier weight in an odd way. I had no idea how I was gonna attack those. I did 10, dropped it, picked the bag up. I got through five and I was like, you know, you could drop it just one more time. But in my mind, I'm like, you get them done, and they're done. You don't have to go back to them again. You get to go back on your hands, back on your shoulders, do bear crawls, and you're done. So don't stop. Finished, dropped the bag. I backed up behind the line, put my hands down for the bear crawl, and then the judge said, no, no, you gotta bring your bag back behind the line. So I, you know, stumbled over, went back to, I'm like, if I pick it up, do I roll it? What do I do with this thing? Because I don't wanna touch it anymore. <laughs> so I go ahead, I grab it, carry it back, put it down, do the bear crawl. And then the handstand walks, we all got stuck on. The girls that had handstand walks, they should have gotten some credit for that, but it was like that 42 feet was one rep. And if you fell three times, you had to go back to the beginning.
this chipper. Shower yourself with the monster water. I've been doing CrossFit since 2012, but I got injured that led to my disability in 2017. So I've been doing CrossFit like like as additional fitness to my actual sport. I was actually playing netball, so it's as my additional sport, and then loved it. And then 2017, when um, I, I got my injury, and then I literally had to relearn how to walk everything. CrossFit gives you a lot of confidence that I kind of lost with the, the diagnosis of COPS and the sternum. Because obviously people see with you as, um, as a disability, like, oh shame, don't worry, you don't have to do this. And that's not something that I want to be like, okay, cool, how can we change this so you can do this? With like, that is why this is amazing for us to be here. Dystonia is kind of like Parkinson's. It's like re repetitive twisting mov movements of your muscles. So mine affects from my, my left side of my core up and down, or down to my foot. My foot is the worst affected. But I just call my leg my baby leg because the muscles, are, they're not that big as the, as the right one, obviously, because you're going to use all of them probably. So, and the CRPS is just, um, it's a, a, a chronic pain condition. So that also, it comes with nerve damage and stuff like that. And so it's not, um, mine, like I said, mine, I was not born with a disability. Most, most of the people um, that's competing, obviously, kind of were born with a disability or acquired it pretty, pretty early in their life. Um, or others don't, others are like me, they, got it like a couple of years ago. I literally, I landed awkwardly at the netball, netball practice um, and then I dislocated my hip. So um, with the dislocation, luckily my muscles were strong enough to pull the hip back into the socket, but with the, <laughs> with the came coming back into the socket, everything, like every, everything was damaged. From the start, obviously my parents, they didn't know how to handle everything, obviously, because I was like a top level athlete and I literally had to relearn completely learn how to walk. And seeing the frustration that obviously a person goes through from you you literally train three hours a day for national side and then now like what now you literally have to call my mom to tie my shoes because I couldn't bend so it is seeing that from my parents I think it took a much greater hit on them than it actually did on me because nobody wants to see the child suffering obviously but then after a while I was like okay cool I can actually make this work and then I told my parents listen stop like babying me, <laughs> I don't want to be babied. Like, just treat me like everything was before. Sometimes it's gonna, some days are gonna be a, bit, be a bit harder than other days, but not all all, all days are bad. I'm a full time student and I work full time as well, so that is difficult juggling everything. So I'm, in the mornings I'm up half past four. I'm up in the gym by five, gym from five to half past six. Then make sure I have to get to work by seven. For me. Um, living with it, especially with CrossFit, um, it made life easier to cope with it because you, you kind of feel left out and then you, you can do stuff now that other people thought you can do or you even thought you can't do. And now you say, hey, I can actually do these things. At the end of 2019, I decided, no, I want to get back into CrossFit. Like I absolutely loved it and I think it would benefit me as a person as well to get part of that community, part of the team aspect again. Like my, both of my diseases are actually progressive and the doctor's like, no, like you, whatever you're doing is working. It's conscious mind like stagnated. So it's just whatever you're doing is working, can go on. The adaptive community in South Africa, they're growing. They're very, they're, we are growing. And obviously for me to be here and show them, listen, you can also be a CrossFit made my life so much easier. So to say to anyone like listening, if you have a disability, especially in South Africa, we don't have the best healthcare for like public healthcare sector. So if you can make life easier for yourself by just joining a gym, it will be amazing. It's amazing what you can do for yourself. Among the athletes, there's a full range of emotions around the upcoming swim event. All right, let's talk about this swim now. Fletch and Duplessis and Brett Horchar find themselves to be strong swimmers. I feel I'm a pretty good swimmer. Swimming is one of my, because I played water polo as well. Swimming is one of my, my strong points. On the other side of the spectrum, Mihail Padrini opts out of the event entirely. I don't swim. Uh, there are some places that you have go fit, but uh, there are places where you don't go fit, and I, I, I can't. I, I were there to cheer up my, my competitors. In the middle of the spectrum sits Beth Tannett and Sly Herod, both with their own personal anxieties around the open water swim. When they announced the open water swim, instant terror went into my eyes. I have water anxiety for no particular reason except that after my car accident, I um, thought that if I was to have to swim to save my life, that I would not be able to because my leg didn't work anymore. 
I can swim underwater, I can swim in a pool because you're going like five, 10 meters. You grab the side, you're good. When I first get in the water, I hyperventilate and then I'm able to like calm my breathing and then I can go, but it takes me a minute still. And it's just a mental thing. I, I have a special appreciation for people that have panic attacks because you know, some people will be like, just get over it. It's not that simple. Like your brain just has a power over you that you can't control. I might as well try. Like what's the point of, of being here and making all this way and not even attempting? All right, let's see how far we get. It's kind of how it is. We had a mass start, so there was a lot of us trying to get around people, and I'm I'm not ruthless either, so I'm not gonna like go over the top of people. And we're all adaptive, so we don't want to be more adaptive. And I'm like, I don't want to hit one of my competitors and prevent them from being able to advance or hit their one limb or whatever. So it it was really hard. They're telling us there's a drop off. It gets deep, and so once we get to the drop off, I start trying to swim and I'm going and then I get my head up over water and I see people are still running. So I put my feet down and I start running and I'm like, well, why bother swimming if I'm gonna run? You know, just might as well do that. It was more like a trudge through sludge because it's not really sand at the bottom, it was really kind of mucky. Then when it got deep enough, I was like, all right, now's the time to swim. Well, you put your head in this water, there's so much green from how much seaweed there is, you can't even see where you're going. Like you can't see one inch in front of your face, so you don't know if you're going in the right direction, if you're about to get a foot in your face, like what's going on. That was terrible. Not even knowing the immense amount of like Loch Ness Monster that was hiding in the water called seaweed that was grabbing at your feet, grabbing at your hand. I just started to like get panicked because of that seaweed. So I went old school like drowning five-year-old of just like slap and turn my head with every single stroke to keep moving. The fact that there was seaweed like in my face made it that much harder to get over that water anxiety. And there was like seaweed, seaweed, seaweed right there and you're like sucking seaweed in your mouth and all this stuff. It was really terrible for my water anxiety. And then they released the masters one minute after us which I felt like, could we have just a few more minutes? Because when they came out, it was like, they came out guns blazing and they didn't care if we were in their way or not. I thought there, was, there wasn't gonna be another heat behind me. Somebody pulled my friend Sarah, they pulled her leg under, she got caught in the seaweed, had to call a paddleboard over so she could get untangled to get her one, be able to use that one leg. And somebody, one of the master's athletes went over my legs. I mean, I'm sure it wasn't intentional, but it's just, gonna happen if you have that many people in the water at one time, so. Yeah. Once I got around the buoy, I just went on my back and started doing a backstroke. So I'm like, all right, I can see everything. I know I just gotta go straight back, so just keep pulling. So I'm out there, think I'm getting ready to, to drown. They want to pull me back on the boat. I tell them there's no way I'm getting on that boat unless you absolutely force me to get on there. And the best moment of that was coming back, seeing my wife and watching her hop around security because she wasn't going to let them stop her and being able to hug as she cried in my arms. So that was the best moment of the weekend. Don't care about event wins. Don't care about the leaderboard was being able to accomplish my biggest fear. I ran swam. What, do, we, do we call that the ran swam? Like, you know, a special event now, the ran swam? That was a, it's almost like aqua trolling. <laughs> that was the most interesting swim that I've ever done. 
I'm kicking myself though, because I came in second for that event and it was a sight finish. It was my fault for letting it get that close. I am pretty sure that when I get home, I'm gonna tattoo, remove all doubt on my arm so that I don't ever ease up again. There are some girls that have messaged me several times and while I've been here and they said, you know, you're like the CrossFit mom. I just try to be encouraging to them and just want to motivate them to continue. And um, I, w I love seeing new people come on board. There was a girl, um, it was probably two years ago now, with COVID I get kind of lost in my sense of time. But uh, her name's Amalia and she's a wheelchair athlete. And I post things on Instagram thinking, you know, if it reaches one person or makes a difference to one person, then that's, it's worth it. Because I feel like sometimes you post things and you're like, does anybody really care? Am I posting too much about CrossFit? At this point, I'm kind of like, CrossFit's a big part of my life, so I don't really care. Um, but I had um, talked to her through Instagram and she was asking me a whole bunch of questions about being an adaptive athlete. And she used to do, she used to run and stuff and she had a hip injury. And I said to her, I was like, you need to reach out to Wilwad and you need to do some of the like programming with them because it would be a great fit for you. And if not forever, then while you're rehabbing. And she ended up, um, she has a permanent impairment. She's a seated athlete now. Um, she can get around on crutches. So she is a seated athlete with hip function because she doesn't have paralysis. Um, but she spends most of her time in a wheelchair and she won the Wheel Wad Games in 2019. So that was amazing. Like the fact that she was there and she won and it was like a really positive experience with fitness for her when she felt like fitness was just something that was no longer gonna be at that level, gonna be an option for her. That felt amazing to me, but also I loved that for her because I understand feeling like you're not ever gonna get to that level again and feeling lost and then finding it and, and just how a sense of um, accomplishment that it gives you. I will continue to post on Instagram about my story and stuff. I have some new followers and lots of adaptive people that I've never heard from before or seen before. You know, there's different organizations out there that um, have adaptive athletes and just people that I haven't crossed paths with before. So I just want to like, welcome all of them and just want to like have everybody participate like just try it and if you're not at that rx level just do it like because eventually you, you will be you know i'm excited for all adaptive athletes out there or all people who have a handicap who are thinking about it who don't think they can just to watch this and be like wow like there's people like me who are at the crossfit games i want to be there the first thing that they did was include us here on this stage. I've been stopped by numerous different veterans here that was like, this is the highlight of the week. But even the judges didn't even know kind of our journeys. I look at it as an opportunity to just help people on their own journeys. It all comes down to a choice. I think the coolest thing about adaptives and shedding light on adaptives or even like the masters is that it removes the barrier of excuses because Tons of time, the reason why we don't do something is we believe that our excuses are bigger than the reality that we make it to be. We're humans, and, and, and just by the simple example of putting you in a bed and a doctor comes and tells you you cannot do that anymore in your whole life, the first thing you're gonna do is try to do that thing again. It's exactly what happened to me. The same thing that I did is the same thing that I tried to pass to other people. If I think CrossFit is those individuals who are like former D1 athletes who are going ahead and doing bar muscle ups and flipping tires and doing that kind of stuff, I don't think I can do that. But if I see a one-armed guy doing rope climbs and, and other people who are um, doing stuff that I'm, I look at them and say, I can do that, it makes it possible. Just being there and being an ambassador in my own community, it starts in the micro which then helps create the macro effect of what we're able to do.
they didn't give us assigned lanes, which I thought was kind of weird because you're like trying to get around with, with different pull-up bars. Whenever I was first diagnosed, I did a lot of pull-ups. Originally it was just hanging because I was hanging from one arm and I had to learn how to re-grip on the other side. I'm used to a smoother pull-up bar. So I go ahead and I start doing pull-up bar and I realize that I instantly tore within like four pull-ups. I went out with a set of five to start, which is a big set for me, and I knew it, but it felt really good. And then when I went to go try to do them again, it was like I just couldn't get the timing and I was fatigued already. So I had to do like a, a pull-up almost and then kip and like bump my chest up to the bar, which is totally inefficient. It requires a lot more muscle than just doing one chest bar, but it just, my timing was off. So I get over to the ski, I was like, all right, the ski. You just kind of get there. That's a lot more upper body and just crunching with the core there. There is a lot of glutes and hamstrings included that people, you know, tend to forget about, but at least with my condition, it was a big part of my training. I even have one of those in my apartment also. So whenever, you know, COVID hit and we're all in lockdown, I skied my little heart out because that's what I had. So every day was ski, ski, ski. So, you know, if you weren't fatigued in your lats from the chest to bar, then let's just make it a little bit more fatiguing with the ski. I ski a lot, so I had a pace kind of in my head that I knew I would be able to maintain and at least kick up a notch for the last round if I made it through. But the double under number was so high and that turf was no joke. The turf for double unders, my God. So I go out and I place my rope down, make sure it's untangled. I go ahead, I grab it, and I try to do one double under and I can't do one double under. Whenever we had the athlete briefing, for that event. The amount of people when they, they were like, is there gonna be a mat on the turf for us to do double unders? They were like, no mats. Everyone was like, oh, blah, blah, blah. You hear all these like murmurs of like, what the heck? You get the drag from the turf, plus it's wet. And so your, your rope is slowing down. And for all of us, you know, we basically, I mean, I have two legs, yes, but a basic, we all pretty much do do double unders on one limb. I'm pretty sure all of us did one at a time. One of the guys came off the floor after he was done and he was like, he said to Natalie and Amy and myself, you just need to jump higher. And we're all like, we don't jump very well. If you can't tell, we don't have two functioning limbs. He meant well to try to give us some advice, but uh, you really did, you had to jump higher. You had to do double unders the way you coach people not to do double unders, like tuck your knees into your body or kick your butt with your heels, jump high, whip really hard and use your full arms to get through those double unders. It was the craziest thing and I never, ever, ever hope I have to see double unders on turf again. Double unders on, 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 <laughs> on turf, is everybody had trouble with those. 75 of these, yikes. I think I got to like 35 and my vision went. I see my coach, he's like, Brad, you got this. And then I looked at him and I shake my hands. I'm like, double unders, no, like, I don't know what I'm gonna do. And he, he gives me, I see his mouth just move. He goes, oh shit, <laughs> like, he's just like. The judge was saying numbers <laughs> and I finally said, heard her say, you're done. And I made it back. I somehow did pull-ups and then made it back to the ski when all the lights went out. I got tapped on the shoulder, said it was time to get up, and that's all I remember from that event. Everything was soaked. I did not think I was gonna have to change that day, but I did. I remember coming off, my wife was like, why are you sweating so much? I'm like, I have no idea. You cannot come here, say that you're at the CrossFit, for CrossFit Games, and ask for single unders. You're at the freaking CrossFit Games, if you want. We call the CrossFit Games athletes who have to live up to a standard. I hope that we as athletes want to have the highest standard, have the toughest test of fitness, because, well, that way, the sport just grows. Because we are not asking for double unders, we ask for singles. What's the next generation going to do? Singles, right? So, but if we are trying to do ring muscle ups even, or handstand walks, or stuff like that, the next generation is going to be, it's going to see what they can do, and 
it's like CrossFit, right? The evolution of CrossFit. When it first started and where it is now, like the kids, if they start soon, because they see that there's other athletes out there, they're gonna do crazy things. What, they'll watch us and be like, you guys just did that? Like, that, that's the way you guys lift it? Yeah. And, and I hope that happens. It'll be, be to me in 10 years, fun to look back and, and see like, all oh, these guys are, these kids are ki killing us. When it comes down to it, competition and being a competitor can be a very individual, you know, self-centric pursuit if you allow it to be. So to me, having my family, having a son, it's just given me that greater sense of purpose to be the best that I can be in everything that I'm doing, whether it's as an athlete, it's as a business owner, it's as a husband and a father. You, you feel like there's someone who is depending on you. I, what I do now and the way that I operate myself now is gonna have a lasting effect on who he becomes as a person. And I, I only want the best for him, for him obviously, um, as I think most parents do for their kids. How I conduct myself on the competition floor and in my day to day, it's going to kind of carry over into who he is as a person. And, and I, so I want him to you know, see me as, as a hero. You know, my, my parents are some of my heroes. They're honestly some of the hardest working people that I've ever met in my life. And so I want him to have that same perception of me. I feel like I am a, a good representation of what hard work can, can do for you if you are determined and you're not willing to give up on things. I've been thinking about that a lot, honestly, and training and you know kind of grinding in the gym in the last few weeks you kind of get to the point where all you really want is to, is to just get here um, and, and just kind of get things going so i've been kind of keeping him and my wife and the other people who are um, you know super super supportive of me in the back of my mind whenever i'm about to start you know my third or fourth workout of the day or whatever and i'm not really feeling like I'm not really wanting to do it. I'd much rather kind of just chill out and, and relax a little bit, but I know that that's, you know, ultimately it's gonna pay off for, um, you know, the people who have made sacrifices for me to be here, the people who have supported me. Everybody's probably noticing the change in my voice. My girls, the daughters, they're everything. Um, because we work out in the garage, they come out in the morning, they love hanging on the rings, deadlifts, watching mommy and daddy work out. For my girls, they get to embrace the beauty and strength because for so long, beauty was defined in these weird kind of boxes that you had to be in. But now, it's kind of cool that you can be strong, that you can lift a heavy barbell, that you can do pull-ups and you can do all these amazing things. And so the sport can show that women can be beauty and strong at the same time. Having that balance for them and also setting the example of eating right, moving your body right, being able to do that and us as parents being the example for them is everything. The daughters. Before every event, I, I find him and my wife in the stands. After every event, make sure I find them in the stands because I honestly, whenever I, whenever I kind of embody how much they mean to me before I'm going into a workout, I honestly feel like it, it helps me kind of shut out the negative sides of what I'm doing. So if something's feeling painful, if I can kind of keep them in the back of my head, I can kind of I can kind of shut that off and just kind of keep myself going and know that it's all going to be worth it in the in the end. I'm back in the Coliseum. We're gonna do burpees and thrusters. It's traditional CrossFit, you gotta finish with thrusters. Uh, they saved it for last. Like, everything was different. You're told a different box size. So I'm like talking to my judge, like, I can't fit this way. Like, which way do you want me to go? I can do very well with holding my foot in front. Me, 
my burpees are so slow because I do it on one leg, so my burpees are very slow. Rebecca and Alicia, they're very fast on their burpees. And I know Abby is very, very strong. So for me, I have to find that balance because I know I'm strong, but I'm not as fast on my burpees. But if you give me a barbell, you give me a calorie machine and I'll absolutely crush it. But that push press weight was heavy. And if I was able to get one of those, that was gonna be PR. I have a really hard time dropping back under the bar and feeling like I'm comfortable with where my foot placement is so that it doesn't impair where the bar goes. I apparently have a tendency when I dip um, and drive out of that dip to, I always step out, you know, kind of Amy does the same thing um, with this leg and this one stays planted. But when I do step out, it almost, I almost rotate. And so then the bar is like rotating. So to press out of that, it's not gonna happen. We had a workout for the wheel ward in the end of 2020. I literally, I'm not a very emotional person and I started crying like in the middle of the workout because I was so tired. So, and after that I was telling myself, no, never again I'm gonna feel this tired <laughs> during a workout.
I got to the round of eight and the most pain I've had since the spinal tap where they hit my nerve. It was like an electrocution through all of my nerves. That was really killing him. And when he finished the final thrusters on that, I said, you got six more of each. That's it. Four and four, two and two, you got this. Everything just hurt. Yeah, um, it started like seizing. I went back for a round of six. I sat down for a second and I just started catching my breath and started talking to myself. I knew I wasn't like, I was just gonna, I was gonna finish it no matter what happened to be there. That's all I knew in my head. I didn't care how much time it took. They could have had another crew coming out there. I was gonna finish the workout regardless. Whenever I was done, I made sure I was in his lane. And when he looked up, I gave him like the eye signal, like, look at me here, don't stop. You can do this. I know he was hurting that day going into it. My heart cried for him to know that he was in pain and was still out there giving it his best. back, finished it, and it was like I'm walking out on my own two feet. As soon as I got past the finish line, everybody came. I couldn't be happier to have shared that final moment, to have him cross that finish line, just waiting for all his brothers to embrace him in his arms for just that accomplishment of finishing. I remember going over, they were like, take a picture, smile for the camera. We walked off slowly. I went instantly to a mat in like 20 minutes. I was just laying there, everything spasmed, and it was just crazy, crazy pain is all I remember. I've been suffering just to try to get here for all those years. Being here, I mean, I get goosebumps just by telling you, it's, it's, it's a dream come true. It's, I, have, I, don't, I don't even have words for it. What I feel right now and seeing my last name in a t-shirt, I mean. It seems to be that we're, we're all kind of working together and we all want everyone to succeed. CrossFit made my life so much easier. So to say to anyone like listening, if you have a disability, if you can make life easier for yourself by just joining a gym, it will be amazing. It's amazing what you can do for yourself. To be representative of, the, of my country, because for my country it's a pride. And for me it's a pride representing my country and my, my box. I got, to, I got to meet Dave at the uh, awards ceremony. I cried in Dave's arms because <laughs> I was, he, he congratulated us and uh, he was like, how do you feel? And at that moment, everything just came over to me and I, I started just busting out into tears, just thanking him for everything and just making us feel included and giving us this opportunity to uh, show who we are and that we are our own set of athletes as well. I remember a conversation that I had with my brother. I was talking about some of the workouts that I'd been doing and some of the programs that I was following and this and that. And uh, I, I kind of said, I don't know if there will ever be adaptive competition, 
but I enjoy doing it, so I'm gonna train like I'm an athlete anyways. If that competition never comes up, then oh well, I've at least gotten to do some cool stuff and, and really optimize my fitness. And if it does come up, then I'll be ready for it. If I were to talk to me a couple years ago, I'd say I'm proud of you for not giving up. But there's also gonna be more challenges coming your way. So challenge yourself every way possible, even if you don't think it would be a challenge or if you think you would never have to do something. If we think about it, the games is a representation of life because life is unknown and unknowable. Through the events, through the logistics, through the scheduling, in the middle of the workout, I don't know how my body's gonna respond, but it's similar to life. Like life, we don't know what's gonna happen 10 minutes from now. Even when life throws you curveballs, how are you gonna react? That panic is gonna hit you, but can you catch your breath? Can you step through? And can you overcome the challenges that happen to be there to keep going in the direction you wanna go? For us in the UK, there's not, I don't know any comps where there's an adaptive section. Even if it's taking it from the CrossFit Games and being like adding an adaptive category to like smaller comps um, that are more local so more people can go and do them. Our goal is to pave the way and to show people that you can do it. Like it's okay that if you have issues that you always thought, I shouldn't do this or I can't do this. Like it was our goal to show that you can. There is some way, somehow that you can make it happen. So we are very honored and privileged, all of us, just to be given that responsibility to say, look, we did it and so can you. We've also spoke about um, like a few of my devices that I use for say snatches. They work, they're all right, but they're not perfect. So it's nice to have like the, the big stage, everyone looking at us, and then someone like from down the road might be like, you know what, I've got this and it might actually work better for this. So it's like opening up everyone's eyes to see it. So hopefully we might be able to get better help from it.